Chris, would you like to start us off? So I think Chris is having audio. Uh, yeah, no audio. So um, I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, call the Student Programs and Services uh, meeting for the Weathersfield Board of Education uh, to order. Today is October 21st. Um, and today's agenda is regarding the hybrid and remote teaching model. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with the group. Bear with me for one moment here. We good? Yep. So I'm just going to provide a little bit of a, a short introduction just for a few minutes, and then I'm going to turn it over to some of our uh, guest teachers today to uh, share their experience. So uh, first of all, thank you everybody for joining us tonight for Student Programs and Services. I'm super excited to have seven teachers from across the district join us this evening to share their expertise and perspectives related to teaching in the hybrid model in which they are teaching remote learners along with learners physically present in their classroom. Teaching today is unlike anything we have ever asked our teachers to do. They're teaching into living rooms, into bedrooms, and engaging with students in new and innovative ways. So never ever did I imagine that we could engage and teach our youngest learners, including pre-K and kindergarten students through video conferencing. Never ever did I imagine uh, the classroom culture would span across not only classrooms, but into living rooms in different homes across the district. Never ever did I imagine that parents in public schools could choose to have their child educated from home. And never ever did I imagine that we'd be having Board of Education meetings through Zoom. Mm -hmm. uh, and never ever did I imagine that educators would be talking into computer screens for large parts of their day. So this is just a few of those crazy things that we never ever imagined um, and situations that we are making the best of it uh, for each and every day. So our educators have multiple degrees. However, as you know, uh, their degrees did not help prepare them to teach in a pandemic. That was not part of any syllabus outline ever. Our teachers have been absolutely stellar. Uh, they are innovative, resilient, and most importantly, they care deeply about the success of their students. Teaching during a pandemic, regardless of the model, is incredibly hard. And one of the hardest things is that it keeps on changing. As soon as we somewhat get comfortable with distance learning, we implement a hybrid model. And now we're looking at a full return of students with a certain percentage of parents who are still opting to have their child educated through full-time remote learning. As hard as it is each week and each day, it's incredibly hard. Our teachers have been the utmost professionals who are committed to doing what is best for our students. So in addition to recognizing our teachers this evening, I also wanna thank our parents and our community for their support because we don't wanna underestimate the impact this pandemic has had on each and every one of us, um, on our lives personally, our families, our students' lives, and the families, businesses, and community members. So before I turn it over to the high school teachers to get us started, I wanna share with you a few of the essential questions I've asked the teachers to talk to this evening as they reflect on their teaching and learning in a hybrid model. They aren't gonna discuss every essential question. Instead, uh, these are questions that really prompt um, thoughtful kind of dialogue and some examples that they're gonna share from their particular classroom. So it's an overview of um, different elements of hybrid and remote learning. They're gonna talk about um, ins uh, instructional practices that have been effective in their classroom. Um, engagement has been something that's incredibly important. It's how we engage students through um, the screen and video conferencing, but also in person. Um, developing that classroom community. I'm in awe of the feeling of a classroom community when students don't even step foot within that classroom and they're part of that classroom community. 
Um, as you know, uh, social emotional learning is a focus and some of them will share a little bit about supporting social emotional learning throughout the day. And overall, how's it going? What are the rewards? Because there are a lot of rewards, a lot of silver linings, but there's also challenges and we want to recognize those also. So instead of starting today with introductions, I'm actually going to ask each teacher to introduce themselves as we go through the agenda. Uh, but here's a little bit of a preview of our agenda and um, the teachers that are joining us this evening to speak about their grade level. Um, so we're actually going to start at the high school and work our way down to kindergarten um, today. So I'm going to go ahead and turn over to Mark to get us started. Thank you, Sally. Um, I'm actually going to present my screen because in, in trying to be the best teacher I possibly can, I actually went through the questions and kind of wrote down some answers for each one and put some documents on that I thought I could share with you all so that you could see sort of what I'm talking about. A lot of people are visual learners. I'm one of those. So it's always very helpful to actually um, for me to see. Um, so let me see here if I can do this right. Okay, you should be seeing uh, my document, correct? Yep. So let me just start by saying my name is Mark Fister. Um, I've I've seen I've met and seen some of you before as board members. Uh, most recently, probably with the introduction of the film class, which I'm going to kind of use today as our as my example of things that I'm doing in the classroom. I've been teaching 24 years, and so many things that Sally said in that introduction are just so right on the money. Uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time reiterating those because um, I know there's a lot to talk about tonight, uh, but it is certainly one of the more challenging years uh, I've had as a teacher. I, I came home the first week and a half and I said to my wife, I said, I think I feel like I'm beginning to beginning to teach all over again. Like that's sort of what it feels like. Um, it's just a whole new way of, of learning about things. And you know, I started with the idea of, okay, I'm going to try to do things the way I normally do them and then just adapt as it goes along. And I learned pretty quickly that that just doesn't work very well. Um, so I actually start all of my lessons now or start planning all of my lessons now thinking about the remote learners first and sort of start with, okay, how am I going to get all of them engaged and then sort of work um, backwards from there. So I do have uh, my Google Classroom for my examples of the, the most effective um, instructional practices. Google Classroom is just so good in, for so many ways. And, you know, all the teachers are using it right now. I do have my link there so you can see my actual film class, which looks like this. Um, and it's got, you know, all of the possible assignments. This is all the things we've done so far, uh, which is already a lot, uh, which it is is normal to a degree. Um, obviously, the the pacing is different now with remote learners, um, and so I'm trying to 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 make sure I cover as much as I normally would. But there are some things that you have to trim and and cut, and that's actually been valuable because it it's forced me to think about okay, what are the most important things that I teach? What are the most important ideas that I teach? And start with those and then, okay, how am I gonna effectively teach these things? Um, so let me go back to my other document, whoops. Oh. Uh, just hold on one second here. There we go. Um, so Google Classroom, obviously very, very helpful. The Pear Deck I've just started to use recently, which is fantastic. And for, for those of you who don't know, Pear Deck um, is basically a way to make sure you can see participation from each student remotely. And they have to sort of participate in the lesson and you get a conversation going or some activity going and you can see who's participated and who hasn't. And that's really almost, I don't wanna say foolproof, but at least it guarantees that the kids that are remote are participating in some way. And you can literally just chime into the kids and say, Sally or Susie or whoever, you haven't participated yet, can you please respond to this? Uh, and so you can literally see every single student responding in some way, which, are, which is great. The breakout rooms in uh, Google Meets now, I just used that for the first time. That's only about two weeks old. 
uh, that Google has developed that. And I just started using it this past week and I just cannot say enough great things about it. It was the first time my kids got to talk to one another. And that is just so valuable for teenagers in high school. Uh, a lot of times they're more interested in what each other thinks than what I'm saying or what my opinions are. So I just used that this week and it was really cool. So I had some kids in a breakout room that were in front of me and they were in a room with kids who were remote. So it wasn't like all the remote kids were in one room and all the, the present students in front of me were in a different, they, it was mixed and matched. And what I had some of the students do is um, go out into the hallways so that they had some way of talking with those kids that were remote without the classroom being completely chaotic and people talking over one another and mics picking up people from one meet to another. Um, and it was great because they were socially responsible in the hallway. They sat across from each other in the hallway uh, and they had these great conversations and they came back in. And the first thing they said to me is, can we do more of that? And I said, yeah, absolutely. If that's really what's working well for you all. Um, it's just very valuable to hear students talk to one another again in a, in a bigger setting than, than we've had. Um, as all of you know, sometimes I have somewhere between five kids in front of me and 12. And it's just a lot different having a classroom discussion when you have 24 kids who are able to, to talk to one another. Um, so as I mentioned, I, did, I do start all of my instruction now, designing all of my instruction with remote learners in mind and sort of work backwards from there. Uh, Interaction obviously is such a huge part of getting those online students engaged. So, you know, in the past where I would present information, I've sort of altered that and really my, my example here will, will work well. So this is for my film class and this is how I taught genre study this year, where instead of giving the students the answers over here, uh, I left the slides blank. So the, the key with this is I want the kids at home to interact with what I'm teaching. And normally we would do that through discussion where I would just say to the students, okay, what do you think the story formula is for a science fiction movie? And they would participate and chime in and they would just, you know, we would then come up with the answers here. So you can see by this slide, everything here is blank. When I present it to them now, I present them with the answers. which will look like this. So I've highlighted them all in yellow and then the students are taking their slides and filling that information in as I'm presenting it. So this way I know that every single student who's in class is actually participating in what I'm teaching them, right? So you have direct instruction, but you also have a way for them to interact in the lesson and, and take notes in their slides. So they don't have any of these answers, I post these, I put them in bright yellow so that they know where the answers are and what they're supposed to type. And then I basically go through them one by one with them. At the end of the lesson, the students would then hand this back in to me so that I know, in fact, they have participated in the lesson. They were engaged in taking notes for it. Um, we can go to classroom discussions, other things as we go. Okay, so that's one example of sort of how to deliver direct instruction and have students stay engaged. Um, the skills that students are using the most, obviously technology is huge, it kind of goes without saying, but I really, I think number two here is really something that can't be underestimated. The skills, the organizational skills that students are now, I don't want to say forced to develop, but they're learning very quickly how important it is to be super organized. Um, there's the Google Classroom, can, things can be everywhere. Um, and so even stripping that down and making that sort of simple and direct, um, which is part of my clear example here uh, for setting clear expectations, which I'll get to in a minute. It's just so, so, so important right now for kids to, to uh, manage their time and to be organized with exactly what it is they're doing. OK, um, I'll give you an example here of sort of that. Um, activity I'm having kids do, which is sort of hands-on. So my film class, I made them actually use their cameras or, or Chromebooks if they wanted to, to basically apply some of the things I taught them. So I taught them all of these different kinds of camera angles and camera shots. And then what I wanted them to do is to use their phones and create a small scene 
30 second scene and use their phones and their Chromebooks to use these shots to tell a story. So this is what one of the students came up with. She said, student is sitting at the table. She is shocked by what she sees. There is a spider on the ground. And then the student steps on the spider. So you're gonna see that now with the student using their phone. So here are the shots. Right, so we have a full shot of the student sitting at the table, staring into nothing, right? We now have a close up of her seeing something that scares her. Okay, now we have a close up high angle shot of a spider on the ground. And I was shocked at her. I said, I cannot believe how big this spider is. <laughs> really frightening. And then what's really creative here is we have the last shot of her stepping on the spider and it's from the spider's perspective. <laughs> Okay, so we're normally, I would just have a classroom discussion about these things. I would have students take one or two shots. I really have to give them the time to show me application of knowledge. And that's really the, the biggest point right now, I think, in teaching. Students have all the information they need at their fingertips. If they don't know it, they can look it up in a second. So it really becomes, okay, what are you going to do with that information, right? So a lot of people have professional jobs. You have to produce something. And that's really, I think, where we are right now in education. We have to have students produce things. Uh, performance tasks and performance assessments are really a great way of seeing kids apply things they've learned. And so you can see that in this example, right? You have a student creating something, just using her phone um, and creating a story there, right? So it's the beginning of maybe a film career for somebody, you know, maybe one of those students sees something like this and says, you know what, that was really fun today. And Maybe I would think about making films or maybe I'd think about applying to a film school or something like that. So it can be the beginning of something um, very valuable for the students. The strategies to motivate learners, uh, the, I think the most important one for me is to set clear expectations. I'm putting up my, what I'm calling my syllabus basically for my period seven class. And for me, I, I learned this last spring is that you just have to be as simple as you can about where students have to go to get their information for the day's lesson. So all I simply do is put up the date. I put up exactly what it is we're doing, just like a college syllabus would do. Um, you can see if I go down just a little bit. So what we do in class, right? So you have one and two here, things we did in class, and then you have their homework listed there. So for me, I'm simplifying for students so that they know every day, all I have to do is go to today on the schedule. The work that I, I need will be right there for me. It's actually in a link for them. So they can just click on that. Whatever it is comes right up for them. Everything in one spot. All right. And I, I, this is, again, one of those things I found out this past spring, which was just that um, Google Classroom pages can get really uh, congested pretty quickly, and then it leads to confusion for students on where to hand things in, where am I going for today's assignment. So students now know for me, they're just going to start at the syllabus every day. We go to that day and we basically go from there. Um, the last thing I would talk about, oops, back to the, oops. Um, the last thing I would really talk about is um, the social emotional learning piece. Uh, and it was, it's really interesting. Uh, I found a, a really good uh, pair deck just specifically about that, which is really interesting. But I wanted to just talk anecdotally about uh, one of my students who um, comes from a very abusive background. She's new to Weathersfield. She's only been in town for a couple of months. And um, she's petrified of being on camera. And this lesson that I just showed you where she had to take pictures was quite a challenge for her. And she really, she, she sort of freaked out at the beginning of it. And she's like, Mr. Fister, I don't want anybody to see my face. I don't want to take pictures of me. And I said, that's fine. I said, let's, let's talk about this at some point. And she said, all right, can we talk through email? And I said, well, we can talk through email, but I think it's important that you see me and hear my voice and see my facial expressions because I don't want you to feel like this is a, a high pressure situation. So I said to her, can we make a deal? I said, you can keep your, your camera off and I'll keep mine on and I'll walk you through this and we can just talk. I just felt like it was super important for her to see tone of voice, to see facial expression. I'm often fearful that emails can have a tone that you don't intend 
And so for me, it was really important that she see my face and that we be able to talk live. So I met her during my office hours on Wednesday. Um, this was last week. And I just walked her through the assignment. I said, look, here's what you can do. You can use your, your phone to take pictures of things in your house, like uh, your mom or your dad to see if they want to help your brothers or sisters, or you can use your pets, or you could just use objects. So if you're fearful of putting your face in something, all you really need to do is take a picture of maybe your hands on the keyboard so that people aren't seeing your face. I'm still seeing uh, understanding of the material of the content, right? Where I would see a close up shot of her hands on the keyboard. Um, and that sort of disarmed her. And she's like, oh, I can do that. That's not that hard. And I said, good. You know, if, if, if you have any problems, feel free to, to let me know and we can continue to alter it and, and modify it. And, um, but I, I just didn't think it was, I thought it was really important for her not to just be excused from this assignment just because she's afraid of, you know, showing her face on or taking a picture of herself. Um, so it, that, that's a real example of how to really address the social emotional aspect of all of this. It is overwhelming for a lot of students. It's overwhelming for a lot of adults. Uh, I don't think I've been this stressed since my first or second year teaching. Uh, it's hard. I'm exhausted at the end of the week in ways that I've, you know, never been, or at least not for a long, long time teaching. Um, so I think it's just really important to, to deal with the social emotional learners on an individual basis because everybody's in a different spot. Uh, some of my honors kids right now love it. They love the fact that they, they have time to do things that they otherwise didn't have time to do. They have time to, to do more of their homework and spend time uh, doing their homework when they didn't have that time before because a lot of those kids are in band and in in um, sports and in musicals and and right now I think for a lot of them that focus has been trimmed down to just academics or more on academics and a lot of them are enjoying it other kids are in different places um, so I it, it, you know the social emotional piece is just it's very hard to address generally speaking it's much easier to deal with each student as they sort of go along. I've relaxed um, deadlines for students um, without telling them that. That's the tricky part with teenagers is you can't really make them aware that you're relaxing the rules because, um, you know, submitting something an hour late becomes submitting something two days late. And, and I don't want them to think that, that that's acceptable either. Because as a, you know, in the business world, even though things are different right now, there are still deadlines for people to make. So, um, but things like that are just a gentle way of keeping students engaged, uh, motivated, and um, sort of showing that you you care about what they're going through, what we're all going through, but what they're going through specifically. Mark, thank you so much for sharing. You're welcome. I hope I didn't take too great. much time. No, that was great. And thank you for that visual. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Kim. Okay, thank you, Sally. Good evening, everybody. So I'm going to go ahead and, and share my screen. Is everybody able to see my screen? I was. Okay, yeah. You can, yes, we're yep, good. You look yep. good. Okay, I'm just gonna go ahead and present. Okay, well, good evening, everybody. I'm Kimberly Troy. I am a science teacher at the high school. I teach AP chemistry and um, level one chemistry this year. And I am um, happy to be able to share some of the strategies I've been using in my classroom to still forge ahead despite all the things that we're dealing with. Um, I focused on how I create a uh, classroom community in which um, all my students aren't physically present because this has been something that I really had to think about at length when school started because so much of my practice prior to the pandemic was a sense of a community of learners um, based on my background and my, my past practice as a scientist. So um, I first want to start talking a little bit about um, the learning environment that we were faced with, you know, turning or returning to school in, in the, um, the end of August. 
And the fact that my priority was really the same, you know, how can I provide high quality instruction to my students, um, a community of learners when physically um, kids aren't going to be there all at the same time. Um, so I have a background 15 years of teaching. And prior to that, I was a scientist for five years prior to going into teaching. So I found myself really returning to some of those core practices from when I was working in the lab, you know, when we were constantly faced with variables, you know, this science experiment didn't work. So what did you do? And I kind of started to look at my practice and think about how can I engage my students in a synchronous model? Um, how can I maintain a community in which students are have a feeling of being together when they're not physically together? knowing that I would have a number of students on the computer and I would have a number of students present in class with me and then I would have some students that were remote the whole time. How can I maintain a collaborative environment? Because as Mark was saying earlier, so much of my practice is about engaging students in conversation and discourse. You know, I'm a huge advocate of conversation. I'm a huge advocate of them seeing me, you know, obviously that's easy when they're physically there with me, but when they're on the other side of a computer or you have students that are always remote, seeing me all the time, you know, every day is really important that they see me, they talk to me, they can ask me a question, but even just hear me and hear my voice is, is really important to our learners in maintaining that consistency, but not only that, that they can collaborate with each other. Um, so I have a, a picture here that um, some of you might be wondering, you know, why is there a sunflower here? Um, you know, from biology class, if you can remember kind of a way back, you know, so much we talk about is uh, characteristics of life and that we're all living, you know, and that we're humans, but there are obviously other living things. And my biology students last year and then chemistry students this year um, would have had practice and characteristics of life. And they would understand that one of those characteristics is the ability to respond to your environment. And that essentially we as living things have to essentially adapt to differences. So when my students return to school, um, as I often do in, in making connections to, to you know, real life, we started to talk about the fact that my priority is still the same to engage them as a community but that we were gonna to have to change the way in which we get there. We're gonna to have to just make slight changes to our practices. So um, this slide just kind of gives you an overview of some of the instructional strategies that I've been using this year. And um, some of them I've adapted before or um, after August simply because of you know, what I learned. Um, Mark was talking about the breakout rooms with um, Google Meet. So back in August, when we returned, um, one of my practices, huge part of my practices is labs, inquiry. Um, oftentimes you'll find my community of learners um, not always doing the same things at the same time. You know, my classroom is very active. The kids are very fluid. They're moving around the room. They're engaging in different activities together, separately, just depending on their needs. So one of the first questions I had was, how am I gonna maintain that community engagement when I have some kids at home and some kids in the class? So I kind of looked at it and, and thought about it and, and developed um, Google Meets as a whole class um, and then Google Meets um, with cohorts. So I've been using that since the end of August. Um, I established cohort groupings um, to basically simulate labs um, right, at, right from the beginning. Um, I had student groupings of kids in class with kids at home so that when they did labs, there were kids now on the bench, you have not only a student with you, but you have a student from home or two students from home that are also engaged. Um, so I found that that was a way that I could still engage the students in inquiry, um, but instead of having them all together in a lab opposite each other, I have a combination. Um, so I would start the class typically as a whole class Google Meet. And then at this point, the kids have um, adapted to those uh, classroom transitions pretty well. And they're able to transition between the whole class with warm ups. Um, sometimes we'll engage in a brief warm up or a longer warm up, depending on what we're doing. Um, they'll pop into their breakout rooms. Um, I stay on the whole class Google Meet the whole time. I walk around with my computer. Sometimes I put it on a cart. Sometimes I walk around with it so that the kids can pop back into whole class meet if they have to ask me a question. So I've kind of tried to, you know, emulate what I used to do, but I'm just using the technology um, to adapt, you know, and the kids have gotten used to it as have I, 
Um, we've had some glitches with techno with the um, internet sometimes, um, but that's really been sorted out. So I find that it's been pretty fluid um, as of recently, the past month or so. So that's been working pretty well. Um, in terms of the small group meets, I can't say enough about the importance of that. And again, Mark spoke to that earlier, the fact that the kids have access to each other, you know, and, and that's really, really important for our students for the social emotional learning piece, you know, that they have an opportunity to engage with their friends and engage with their peers, um, not just about seeing me, but being able to engage with each other, um, to analyze data, to ask a question, you know, what did you get for this or what did you get for that? What do you think about this answer? Um, that's been huge to my practice and, and I feel better about where I am um, knowing that that's been working. Um, formative assessments have been a huge part of this year. Um, not that I didn't use them before, but just in terms of student progress and checking in, um, we're doing a lot of student correction and reflection, um, which they're doing together in their Google Meets or sometimes um, between classes and they're uploading a lot of that work to Google Classroom so that I can see it and they also can share it with each other. Um, labs I talked a little bit about already, but one thing I'll say about that is just the additional lab safety practices that we've had to um, adopt at the high school um, in, in light of COVID, you know, that we have certain safety protocols that we follow in the lab at the bench to ensure everybody's safety in terms of social distancing, the way the kids face while they're doing lab work, um, you know, the hand washing, um, the, the sanitizing of equipment, you know, there's a lot of practices that we've um, certainly adopted at the high school to make sure that everybody is safe. And then I can't say enough about Google Classroom. Again, Mark spoke to this earlier, but in terms of the resources and what we're posting there and the fact that we have to be very organized, both myself and the students. And I, I say that to them, you know, we are a community of people. We're all in this together. Um, you know, as long as I'm organized and they're organized, um, it works pretty well. Um, I will say this year, it's a lot more on Google Classroom than I usually do because everything in classwork um, is essentially organized and, and uploaded. Um, I've, I've made sure that I have, um, you know, certain areas for certain things so that when the kids go in there, um, they know what to find. Um, I'm always thinking about those remote learners and in terms of if I was learning remotely from home, would I have everything that I need? I feel like I can access those kids that are physically in class a little um, more easily once a week, but those remote learners, I just wanna make sure everybody has access to what they need across the board. So um, this last slide just gives you kind of a look into what it is that I have going on um, in terms of student work. Um, this first, these first three images is just showing you an experiment that I do every year with my level one students that I usually start the end of August. So when we return to school, I was like, oh gosh, what am I gonna do with that one tube lab? Can I still do it? How can I do it? So I went ahead and, and did it using my new kind of lab model um, where remote learners are paired with someone in class and then in class students would set up their own. And then we have kids across groups comparing tubes. They're sharing images on Google Classroom. So the remote learners are able to participate um, but this just goes to show you some of the comparison kids are making. So these are three test tubes. They're the same chemical reaction, if you can believe it, but look at how different they are in appearance. Um, and then there is Google Classroom slides and, and opportunities for them to share their observations. And then we discuss it as a class and talk about, you know, why the tubes look different, what are the similarities, and then obviously we get into the chemical reaction writing piece. Um, so that they can fully engage in that. And then this last um, student work sample is a lab that my AP students have been working on. And this just kind of gives you a sense of the groupings, you know, like how I, it looks like there's a lot of kids in the groupings, but essentially they're kids both in C1, C2 cohort, as well as remote learning cohort. And then these are some of the um, reactions that they did as groups. Um, so typically what I would do is I would split the lab between the two groups. So C1 and C2, I would split the lab in half and I would have C1 do half of it on, you know, their days in school and they would be observing from home and then I flip it. Um, and then essentially they collaborate and um, what you're seeing here is their pooling of all their data. So all their observations they made, I had them take a picture of each of their chemical reactions. 
Um, don't mind the superhero plastic bag here. <laughs> Sadly, that was some of their favorite part. These are really cool bags, Mrs. Troy. I'm like, thank you. Those are my son's bags for school. But anyway, um, but you just get a sense of how we're making those accommodations for our remote learners so that they can still engage in the observations, even though they're at home. So this, this is a nice way too. like even when things kind of return to normal, um, that I would still do because I the, the nice thing about this is then the students all have a reference, you know, if they don't remember what the bag looked like, and they have it written down, they have a visual. Um, and then all of this gets stored in our classroom um, for their reference. So overall, I would say, though, just sort of in conclusion that it, it is, you know, I, I share Mark's sentiments and that it is very exhausting, but at the same time, there have been rewarding parts also that I feel like I am engaging my students and I feel like I'm able to give them, um, you know, a learning experience despite what's going on. And I'm, I'm trying to be as positive as I can despite all the difficulties we've been facing. And I find that the kids have really been um, just great. And they're, they're happy to be in school. They're happy to be engaging with um, their, their peers. And overall, I think um, some days I have three computers or four computers going on my desk, but you know, I'm just pushing forward and, and doing what I can because it's really about them and, and their experience and, and how I can support them. So thank you. I'm gonna stop Great. sharing my screen. Thanks. Thank you so much, Kim. Yeah, you're welcome. So that was a sampling of two teachers from our high school. We're going to move down to the middle school and I'm going to turn it over to Charlene. Hello, everybody. Um, I am also going to share my screen um, and had put together a presentation. Everybody see it? Yep, looking good. So the first thing I wanted to share was just how we took a look at the beginning of the year and the school year in general, and really wanted to focus, especially at the beginning of the year on student success. Um, and some of the beginning of the year was just trying to get to know um, the students that were both in school and remote, but also focusing um, a lot more on science practices, um, the NGSS science practices, um, which include data analysis, um, learning about the experiments, and um, claim evidence reasoning responses, and just really trying to set the students up for success throughout the year and for beyond that. In fact, we're actually keeping um, remote Wednesdays really focused on those science practices so that that can continue throughout the year and support the students in that way. Um, also at the beginning of the year we had to rearrange our curriculum and we really wanted to rearrange it in a way that would really help with student engagement and helping all students be successful right at the beginning. And so we started our um, curriculum this year with energy. And what I'm gonna be taking you through is an interactive digital journal and what the kids are actually working on right now um, in energy. And so you'll see on your screen, the popper experiment. And something we wanted to ensure was to make sure students still were able to do hands-on activities and labs. And in order to do this, um, we provided all of our students, both remote learners and in-school learners with science bags. And the science bags have included things like poppers, um, Play-Doh, string, mini skateboards, um, all kinds of various um, materials where students each have their individual um, materials so that they can participate whether they're at home or whether they're in school. Um, and we do a lab like this. And so um, in this lab, the students had poppers that they turned inside out and were exploring um, energy through them. And both at home and in school, they had a great time um, exploring these poppers. And um, it was really great because we wanted so much the kids to be able to still do hands-on learning. We didn't want everything to be on the computer um, because I think to some extent, the um, students are getting kind of computed out. Um, and so this was a way to do that. Um, the great thing about this is both remote learners and 
students in class can both actively be engaged in this. The challenge of this is um, resources. Um, instead of buying class sets of things, we bought um, one for each and every individual learner. Um, and so at this point, I think we're about three quarters of a way through our science budget and this, um, these resources will take us through to about the end of November. And so we're going to have to be creative with the end of the year and how we're going to um, tackle that um, with the resources we have available. Um, one of the other things that I've found really important is um, trying to give students the opportunity to express their learning in different ways. And so um, in a next generation science standards, students develop models. And this is actually a model of the Popper experiment. And one student chose to do this um, through an actual hands-on drawing. And a lot of students still like to do this. And we want to make sure that we're giving students the ability to express their learning in a way where they can physically draw things as well. So one of my students cho chose to do it this way, and another student chose to do it through um, chose to do it through Google Draw, and so really trying to provide those options for students so they can express their learning in different ways is really important, and letting them still sometimes do um, physical drawings of things versus it all being um, through technology. Another way that we want. Um, students to be able to access um, their learning in different ways. And so one of the ways we engage students is through videos. And so um, this is an example of, um, there's a link here to a brain pop video and students are taking notes. Now, what's nice about this is it's actually scaffolded for them. So it helps them in the beginning of the year with um, note taking. And by the end of the year, we hope to be able to take away those scaffolds so that um, students will be able to take notes more independently. But this is another engaging way for students to um, be able to access a different resource. I'm gonna take it out of um, the present mode because I want to show you this next slide, which you can't see all of the parts of it in present mode. And so traditionally in class, when we have an article we want the students to read, we hand out a paper article and they highlight it and they write on the sides and they interact with that. Well, couldn't do that this year. And so um, we have created annotated readings within our um, interactive notebook. And this is um, an active reading where students can highlight right in the text. Um, instead of having um, notes that they write on the side, we have sticky notes um, with questions for them to answer. And also as part of this slide, um, you can add um, video clips and different things. So there's a video clip right on this slide that they can combine with um, the actual article to come up with um, a better understanding of what's going on. Um, so that's another way for them to, the students to access the learning in different ways and make sure it's accessible both for the hybrid learner and for um, the remote learner and the um, in-class learner. Um, one of the great things about um, going through this whole process in this pandemic is being finding different resources. And one of the resources we are now using is um, Gizmos Virtual Labs. Um, these are great. Um, you can do everything in this lab from um, just using it as a little introduction, which I use this one for, to having a full blown lab where um, the students um, manipulate different variables and there's all kinds of questions about it and they see the results. And so when we don't have um, the in-class ability to do the lab, um, we can use these virtual labs. Um, another example of one of the virtual labs is a roller coaster creator that we um, used just the other day. Um, the students had to create a roller coaster um, and they were thinking about potential kinetic and dissipated energy and they needed it to be a successful coaster. The students had a great time doing this. Um, they even challenged me because my coaster was, um, I just created a really simple one first and they said, hey, how come your coaster isn't, it's just a simple one. And so I had to show them that I could create one with um, seven loop-de-loops -loop, so that um, they liked watching that at the end. But something that I think the students have really um, 
got out of this hybrid model and skills that they're learning is being more independent learners. In order to do some of these virtual labs, they really need to be following close directions and the directions are all in the lab. And I go through most of it with them, but there are times when I cannot answer their questions straight away. Um, there are times when my virtual learners um, ask a question in the chat and I've walked away. In fact, the other day this happened and I've walked away from the chat. I was um, assisting a student in class and um, a question was out there and I hadn't responded straight away. And the great thing about this is students are becoming problem solvers. Not only they're solving their own problems, but um, they're helping each other. And so because I didn't respond straight away, other students started responding um, to help support each other. And that was just a really great thing to see that the students are troubleshooting. There are even times when it's a technology issue and there are students at home that say, okay, you just need to do this. And so um, they're really coming up with different skills and different um, independent learning and problem um, learning skills. So just like Kim, um, creating that classroom community has always been something that's really important to me. And it is different this year with both remote and um, in-class learners. But some of the things we can keep the same. And one of the things I do is at the beginning of the year, I get students to um, think themselves of how we can be successful in science class. And essentially, I'm asking the kids to create their own rules for the class. And um, the rules were a little bit different that they created this year. Um, things like um, when they were thinking about being remote and being in class, um, focused during independent work, they realized how that was gonna be different for them. And yet some um, guidelines that they come up with is just the same as they've always been when they're focused on respecting each other and being kind. But this is something that we create as a class and then we come back to throughout the year to remind us of ways that we're gonna be successful as a class community. Um, just like um, Kim and Mark, I've been using um, Google Meets um, for discussion. And I, like Kim, actually have everybody join the Google Meet. Um, so whether you're in class or at home, they're able to communicate with each other. And that's been really important for all of the learners to feel part of that classroom community. I've also been doing breakout rooms even before um, Google put the um, added the new link to um, breakout rooms. We were trying breakout rooms just to try and um, help build that class community. But one of the challenges this year that I found um, is that students are having a more difficult time talking to each other. Um, they feel uncomfortable talking on the screen. Um, I think some of it is to do with having the masks on and not maybe being able to look at each other as much because we're all face forward. And, um, and so as a teacher, we had to, I had to be creative of thinking of different ways that students can actively have discussions. And so Jamboard is one of the ways that I've done this where I pose a question and students can post their responses on little sticky notes, but they can also um, interact with each other and so they can respond to each other's sticky notes. Another way that we've been um, looking at this challenge is by using Google Hangouts where instead of um, students having to say out loud and um, have to having to um, talk on the camera, but they can actually just chat with each other through Google Hangouts and have a discussion that way. And so that's been helpful too. The last thing I wanted to share with you is a way that I've just been really ensuring that I connect with students. And this is something I actually started last year um, when I um, was just doing it on paper. And it's something I like, I like to call the chat box. And it's a way for students to um, let me know how they're doing and um, sharing something um, with me. They can share anything they would like. And, a lot of times it's something about their weekend, um, but sometimes it's something they're finding challenging um, or something that they're struggling with. And it's a way for them to kind of share that with me that they don't have to say it out loud in class. And then um, I adapted this for, um, for the digital version where they 
could tell me if they wanted me to check in with them. And so I gave them options that I could check in with them via email. I could check in with them in person if they were in cohort one or cohort two. And then they could say they didn't want me to check in with them. And when we were completely remote, I, there was also an option for checking in with them um, through Google Meet. And so I'm um, just this is my way um, to connect with kids and just really ensure that they're doing okay in, in another way, in a way where they can just say it without anybody else um, seeing it or knowing that maybe they're having a tough time with something. Um, and so when thinking of the hybrid model, um, I like um, Kim and Mark um, also think it's exhausting. I, I've gone home and been like, I have nothing left today. Um, but the main focus for us is really creating an engaging environment for students where they can be successful and where they can still explore different science concepts and um, really grow to love science and creating that strong classroom community. Charlene, thank you so much, that's great. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Rochelle next. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Rochelle Eppland. I teach French and Spanish at Silas Dean Middle School with Charlene. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what remote learning looks like for me in world language, which um, is a little bit of a different area to navigate. Um, because as Charlene was saying, the kids are reticent to talk to one another. And that is basically 100% of what I teach talking in a different language. So we're gonna look at what that looks like. I wanna try something with you. Um, so if you'd indulge me, I will present my screen. However, um, I wanted to use the tech that I'm using with the kids. So I'm gonna put a link here in the chat. And if you just click on it, I think it'll work. I don't know actually if it'll work for everybody because I'm not clear on whether or not it'll work if you don't have a Google email or a Microsoft Outlook email but give it a try. If it doesn't work, I'll still project it and everyone can see it. Um, but see if you can, if you can log into that. This is what I use. So I'll show you um, what I'm doing. I just, I guess I'll just do my desktop. Okay. I'm unfamiliar with Zoom too. So one moment. It's making me give permission. Oh, it? oh, okay. All right. So that should do it. Let's see. All right. Is my screen sharing now? No, not yet. Okay. I'm sorry. There That's okay. This is a great model of what happens in our <laughs> classrooms every day. So don't be sorry. This is a problem solving in action. There you go. It's up. Okay. So that's what my screen looks like. And then I will have, if you were in my class, I would have this secret screen happening. Thank you, Sally, by the way, you were hundred percent right. This is exactly what happens every day. Um, I have a secret screen going and shows me, uh, this is my teacher dash dashboard. This app is called Pear Deck and I'll talk about it in a second. But um, this is my secret screen that the students don't see. And I can see that I have nine people in here, which is awesome. Okay, so welcome to Pear Deck. This is what I use every day with my kids. All right, so it looks just like Google Slides for now, but you'll see. So first I just wanted to talk about, um, I already did really a little bit, what class used to be like in world language and what it is now, I'm sure you can all imagine. They used to be, you know, pretty much on top of each other, doing dialogues, role plays, really dynamic stuff. And now we are prioritizing safety and kids are facing forward with masks and they're shy. And so it's all about how to break through that shell and engage them in, we have to be creative. So Pear Deck is one way that I'm finding to do that. I'm able to deliver instruction like I'm doing right now. I have this presentation and I'm in control of it and you're kind of my prisoner because it moves through and you can't go ahead and you can't go back. So that's teacher paced. And then I can do skill practice with the kids too where they can do it independently either in class or at home. And um, I can see everything that they do, which is amazing. So we're gonna try it. Oh, I feel like I skipped a slide. 
One second. Oh, it did, but that's okay. Oh, there, see, there it is. Let me show you what I mean. Here we go. So here's an example of what Pear Deck can do. It asks you a question. What percentage of the world does not speak English? And it's a multiple choice question. So if you have Pear Deck pulled up right now, you can answer, you can answer that. So go ahead and put what you think. And then I can show what everyone has said. I can show the class. So most people think 50%. Two people have, three people have, four people have, oh boy, this is pretty close. Nobody at 90%. The correct answer is 75%. Congratulations to those of you who got it. Oh, good. Here's a different type of question I can ask the kids. In Connecticut, which country is number one for exports? Drag the dot to tell me, is it Mexico or is it France? And then we'll see what you said. You are all wrong. It is France and it has been for years. Oh my God. All right, let's try a different question. So this one is a number question. Um, how many French words do you think an English speaker with no French education can understand right off the bat? Where do I enter a number right here? Um, what does it look like? Hold on, I'm not really sure actually. Um, you just type in the box to the right, it looks like. Is there like a little gray box on the right-hand side where you can type in an answer? It might be covered up if your window's too small or if you have multiple windows open. Yep, and then there's little arrows if you wanna go up or down for a larger number or a smaller number too. First, you'll have to hit answer question in the bottom right corner. Thank you, Sarah. That'll take you there. I've never actually answered one of these myself. So we'll see what everyone says. Yeah, how did you guess that? That's really good. So there's only a few, it looks like people are having trouble with this one. There's only a few um, responses. responses, yeah. Um, I don't use this one a lot in case you're wondering, but <laughs> the answer is, um, is uh, 1,500 and 17, um, wow. sorry, 100 and, f now I don't know. Now I have to look at it. No, it's it is, it's 1,500. And um, there's actually 1,700 words that are identical to English, which is incredible to think about. All right, let's try another one that's easier to use. Well, this is, your responses might be really interesting. So here's an example of what I'm just talking about. A lot of French words look like English words. This is the French word, un carat. You might not have taken French before, but you can probably guess what that is. Draw what you think that is on the screen. Oh, that looks good. <laughs> yes. Oh, this is way better than I could have done. Y'all speak, speak in French right here too. Look at that. Nice job. Those are so good. Oh, I just hit the wrong thing. Hi, responses. Okay. Um, in which field, for example, culinary business sports, is French one of the top four languages used? And there, there's a hint in the picture, but Take a guess, type in your answer. Oh, type in your answer. Where do I take? Type in my answer. I think it's the same as the multiple choice one. There's like a little bar to the right that you should be able to type in. Now, if we were in school, Bobby, I would be looking at GoGuardian and I would look at your screen and I would tell you exactly what to do. Leave okay, that's home. <laughs> business, sports, culinary, business, 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 culinary. Culinary is a very good guess, but it is actually business. Wow. Um, one of the top four, and the you might want to know what the other ones are. And I have that here. The others are English, of course, Mandarin, and Arabic. 
Those are the mm -hmm. top four languages to know if you are going to be in business. Which probably surprised you. Okay, so, oh, lag it up. So anyway, that's, that's the interactive part of my <laughs> presentation today. I use, Pear that was a really simplified version of how I use Pear Deck. I use Pear Deck almost every day with my kids um, because I can give them pointed feedback either uh, in the app, there's a feedback function that is specific and private where I can type what I like. Um, they get a record of what their responses were after emailed to them. It's called takeaways. Um, and I just uh, discovered yesterday that there's a whole vocabulary learning collaborative flashcard function as well. So um, this is really the best way I found to engage kids. There's these other things that I've been using as well too. Bingo Bigger, Edpuzzle, Educandy, Voice Recorder, Flipgrid. These are all ways that I'm getting kids to um, interact with language and use language. Flipgrid and Voice Recorder are um, two recording devices. Flipgrid records your face and your voice and Voice Recorder is just your voice. And that's the best way I found to um, get kids at home to talk and to hear them and give them feedback about how they're talking. Um, Educandy is a, a website where you can put in vocabulary lists and make uh, fun games with them and the kids can practice. And Edpuzzle has been around for a long time and I've been using that, but I use it a lot more this year. It's YouTube videos and you can um, insert questions that kids answer and they can go back and rewatch and rewatch as much as they want until they understand. And then you can review what they've put and you can give them feedback and then you can use it as fodder for the next lesson to talk about misunderstandings. It's all, it's all really good stuff. But none of that really is collaborative. None of that is really how are my kids in class connecting with the kids at home, which is, um, or connecting with each other, um, which is huge, which is huge because in middle school, which I didn't know prior to coming to middle school, I was a high school teacher for seven years before joining SDMS. Um, those kids didn't like so much working together, but middle school kids thrive. They really like their life source is drained when they don't get to interact with each other. So, um, you know, this is what it used to like, look like on the left collaboration and on the right, this is what it looks like now. I know that doesn't <laughs> it's just in computers, but let me show you what we're doing in eighth grade. So every year we start with, an, with a review project and um, the kids take a uh, vocab set and a grammar term from last year and they reteach it to the class. Um, and I have a death grip on this. I did not wanna let it go because of the pandemic. The kids love this project every year. I love it. I find it invigorating to see them create and to take on the role of teacher. So here's what planning looks like. It's a Google doc, all the kids are in it. They're furiously adding, editing, chatting, commenting, and putting all the info that has to be in there. So on this one on the left, the green page on the left, they've decided 20 vocab terms that are most essential. On the right, they've reviewed the verb and they wrote some sentences to demonstrate how to use the verb. And then they decide on, well, how are, who's gonna do what? We have to present this lesson. This lesson needs to have notes for the students, it needs to have an activity to practice, it needs to have a homework and a quiz and a Google Slides presentation. So who's gonna do all that? They sign up. And then after they sign up, they put their links to all those digital resources that they're making right in the chart. Then the last piece, this was the most challenging because as we talked about earlier, the kids don't like talking even to a camera, to be honest. They had to record their Google Slides presentation using Screencastify to create a basically a video lesson. So each kid in the group was responsible for filming one slide and then one person put it all together into one single video. And I'm gonna show you what that looks like in case I've lost you. It looks like this, this is their lesson. Oh Marsh, the market, a la bougelerie patisserie. On part au pomme. On baguette, on croissant. A la boucher, du pork, du boeuf, du poulet, un steak. All right, so it's not terribly entertaining, but 
they made this. They made this together, kids at home, kids in class. And I'm really impressed with the work that they've done. After they did that, they just designed a class activity. Some kids made a Kahoot, some kids did, um, they used Bingo Baker. Um, and then they created a homework that the kids are actually doing. The rest of the class is gonna complete this homework and check their answers. And then finally a quiz in Google Forms. And they all did this together from their separate locations. And I'm really pleased with how they work together. So that brings me to the end of my sharing and just to reflect on the challenges and the new skills that, the, that are happening now in this time. I'm not going to um, talk at length because I think Charlene hit it on the head with all the challenges. So that the resources are, can be low, um, that the kids don't wanna talk to each other. In world language, of course, um, all the talking that we need to do and that we can't do face-to-face -face is really a struggle, helping, helping the kids get over their reticence to speak. Um, another challenge I'm finding that I haven't heard any men anyone mention yet is helping kids. So kids who are absent, uh, kids who need just extra help, um, it's really hard. I use the remote Wednesday and that is what I'm doing from dusk till dawn on remote Wednesdays. I'm meeting in small groups with kids. I'm talking to them via GoGuardian. I'm emailing them. I'm calling parents uh, all day on remote Wednesdays. I'm so thankful that I'm able to do it. Um, but it just somehow takes a lot more time to give kids the help they need when you can't just, you know, sit next to them and work it out. Um, so that's been really hard. Uh, other things, new, these kids are, as Charlene said, they are becoming problem solvers real quick, like baptism by fire here. You just gotta figure it out. And they are, they're really rising to the occasion. Um, they're showing incredible perseverance and helping others. Um, also, has anyone mentioned, they all come to school every day with a Chromebook and it's charged. It's incredible, yes. They do it, they do it. I've never had a kid forget a Chromebook and very rarely is it not charged, usually at the end of the day when it's you know been stressed for the whole day. So they're doing such a good job with that personal responsibility piece. Um, so, oh, uh, motivating kids. One last thing about motivating kids, we are still doing French pen pals and they're psyched out of their minds. So at least some things the pandemic hasn't ruined. That's it. That's great, Michelle, thank you. And I think one of the common themes you'll uh, hear is, um, I think I've heard it from every teacher, yesterday found out, last week we tried. Um, and um, I'm sure that um, even the people on the call here are taking, like, I haven't thought about that, you know? It's that collaborative approach, we're all in this together and learning. Um, and we're learning as much as the students each and every day as we're trying new strategies. So we're gonna move down to the elementary. I'm gonna turn over to Brandon uh, for, from grade five. Hi there everyone, I'm Brandon Palma. I teach uh, fifth grade over at Hanmer Elementary. And the ongoing joke is that I might be jinxed because I was hired mid-year and la last year was a mid-year school year thanks to the pandemic. So I haven't had a full school year in my classroom yet. I'm thinking 21, 21 2022 is my year. So with that being said, it's such a great opportunity to be here. And I'm about to share my screen and kind of take you through a day that my fifth graders experience here at Weatherfield Public Schools. So um, let me make sure I'm sharing the correct screen. It's this one, yep. So can everyone see what I'm showing over here? Yep, we can see it. Okay. So the first thing I want to show is the app Clever. It is something that we actually have rolled out through all of our elementary programs. But in fifth grade, it's really cool because it kind of streamlines our login process. Um, as you can see, there's actually a badge option. I'm not going to steal that from the second grade teacher and kindergarten teacher who might talk about that. In fifth grade, we love the login with Google button because it pulls them right to a home dashboard of all the tools that they need. You see some teacher tools like PowerSchool and um, Thing Central, but the main app that they use is Google Classroom. So it's gonna pull you right through. 
It's going to log you completely in. As you're going to see, I do nothing. I'm not doing anything on my end. Oh, hold on one second. It requires a second step as an educator to get all the way through. Um, there we go. Um, and it's going to pull me directly into my classroom dashboard. So then I find the classroom. Of course, if you're a student at Weathersfield Public Schools, it's going to pull you right to your teacher's classroom. Um, and so this is basically the dashboard that our fifth graders see every morning. Um, right here, they come into the Google Meet link. But what I really want to showcase is our classwork page. I know Mark touched upon this is that the, in, the importance of organization is so key to Google Classroom being used effectively. So in fifth grade, I really quickly realized that they love emojis. They are addicted to anything and everything emoji. So I was actually able to find uh, an emoji app on a web browser that I then created topics that use the emojis. So there's like a test tube for science. So for those science teachers, I'm sorry if they come to you and think all they use is test tubes, but the emoji is what helps guide them to what subject they need to be in. And then I think what's really important is in the fifth grade and sixth grade levels, we actually use an archive tool where after three or two weeks of instruction, we take the things that are about three or four weeks old and move it down to the archive. So for example, like one time I had to have a sub for a PPT. So I had a post for what we do when Mr. Palmer has a sub. Well, that doesn't need to stay there all day long, every day in the important information tab. It can be dropped into the archives and then I can also pull anything out of the archives. And the other key reason to do that opposed to deleting assignments is that on the teacher end, we have a grade book through Google Classroom. And if you delete the assignment, it actually deletes the scores and comments that you left for your students. So it was actually a way to kind of streamline that process for us. So the first thing my fifth graders do when they log on is they head over to the daily schedule, which is charted out just as a regular school day. We go through all the subjects in fifth grade as a uh, non-swapping classroom. We've got science, social studies, unified arts, math, real loud writing and reading. And we're still hitting all those subjects even through hybrid learning. So the first thing I wanted to show off is our mystery science work. Uh, mystery science has been a fantastic app that we're able to use in the K-5 science curriculum. Uh, they are science units that are actually designed around the next generation science standards or NGSS and they provide us with videos and resources. And if you have a child of your own and you've ever heard of Mystery Doug, this is where Mystery Doug comes from. He is like a celebrity in the science world for K through five. Uh, he keeps it interesting. And um, I've had to adapt some of our work. So what you're seeing on your screen right now is a modeling worksheet, it is the worksheet that is usually given as a paper and they are given coloring utensils to design it. And they're shown this picture, which is a time-lapse overexposure of the night sky. And so what the image is actually capturing is the rotation of the earth. But believe it or not, fifth graders don't really understand the concept of that our earth is rotating as we speak. So we get comments as like that someone is sitting there spinning the camera lens at really fast to capture the stars spinning, or someone's holding the tripod and they're spinning around with their body to capture this image. And so what's really cool is through Google Slides, we were able to create a kind of model sheet where they are going to go back over the course of the next few weeks as we teach this curriculum and modify their illustrations, which they've used the kind of line and shape tool that exists in Google Slides to design these models. And then they're also allowed to use a little bit of explaining about what they're thinking and then they'll go in and revise that thinking as we move through the unit. So as we leave science and move over to social studies, um, I don't know if you know, but it's an election year. And in fifth grade, it's always an election year because it is kid governor. So with kid governor, it is a fifth grade civic engagement program where we teach about state democracy, how our state government works between the judicial branch, the legislative branch and the executive branch. Um, people always get a little concerned with me and they go, you're talking about civics. Are you talking about Democrats and Republicans? No, we're talking about how the system works in and of itself, how there's a legislative body, how there's a board of ed and a town council at the local level that create 
rules and regulations that we follow at the local level, they are informed by the state and then the state level is informed nationally. The cool part is, is that fifth graders are then tasked to run an election on a fifth grade issue and they run on a variety of topics. Now, typically pre-COVID, we would hold a primary if more than one student in fifth grade wants to run for kid governor because each school in our district is allowed to send forth one candidate to be elected at the state level to be Connecticut's state kid governor. This year, we had about 15 candidates and we had to host our first ever virtual live primary. So of course, I struggled with how do you present a primary to kids who are both in the classroom and at home. And that's where Flipgrid came in. So as you can see, I'm the moderator, so I'm right here. But I do wanna take you to our friend, Dina from Mrs. Vicente's class at my school, who is our candidate that we're submitting tomorrow. And you can take a look at her video now. Oh, where's the audio? Is there something special I have to do to play audio through Zoom? I don't know. Okay, we're gonna just pretend like we watched this video. This is again, what I tell my fifth graders that this video was amazing. What you just watched was fantastic and we're gonna just keep moving on. But there are 15 kid governor candidates here and Adina is running on racism and Black Lives Matter and she's created a platform to help support people of color in our community. And she's submitting her video tomorrow and we'll find out next week if she is one of the seven candidates from the state we're running against about 30 towns so there's usually only about there's a, a slim chance that we get in but we always put forth a candidate so we're very excited to see what happens so now as we move forward in our subject list we head over to math so with math we use our go math software which is fantastic and allows our fifth graders to learn and think about math in many different ways what I was tasked with was the hurdle of being able to look at 20 math books with only having half of my students in front of me. So what I decided to create was a Google form that would allow them, if this computer will allow me, to submit their name, provide an image, and I actually found a helpful YouTube video on how to take a picture with a Chromebook, and submit an image and also some of their possible answers that they found in the math book. So that way I can quickly check in on their math work through the use of Google Forms and see what their answers were and where there might've been some confusion. So right now you can see all my students' names. If I click on any of these, they'll actually bring me directly to an image of that student's work. And then um, if I can go back, then I can see, oh, look at that. 12 of my 18 students were able to realize that the answer was 168. Sometimes Google Forms gets a little tricky and same answer, but different lines. And then, oh boy, I gotta go talk to this student who thought it was 1686. And that's just a way to quickly check in on the student's work. So then we continue on moving down the line and we head over to writing. And uh, we were very lucky to purchase our Heinemann virtual resources. Um, Heinemann is our readers and writers workshop team that has made a fantastic curriculum and actually create videos that we can stream from the classroom to our students home and to our students in the classroom. And they're instructional videos that we kind of partner with where they're delivering some of the curriculum that we teach in readers and writers workshop. And then we find opportunities to pause and do guided practice and gradual release of the work. So you'll see right here that I provide my students with a link to the video, as well as a username and password that lets them log right into the video if they're having streaming issues. Because as we know, some of our students have the best internet in Weathersfield, and some of our students have internet that really causes them to struggle. So providing them equitable access to the videos was something I really focused on this school year. Um, and then as we move from writing over to reading, we have a variety of tools in Google Classroom, and I'm also about to show you some Padlet tools as well. Uh, this is the questioning tool in Google Classroom. So as you can see right up here, I provided them a prediction question. Something was happening in the book. Everyone was heading to Portland Street. They knew something was gonna go down and I was asking them what's gonna happen next. And so then you can see, and the students can see on their end as well, the uh, responses that their peers gave to this question. And you can see that they're thinking that the main character is gonna return, 
the trophy that he has stolen and some of his friends are gonna block him and kind of take him away. And as you can see over here, I'm allowed to also provide a score and provide feedback. Um, we have also been using Padlet. You know, we still need to provide our students access to text. And something in fifth grade that we've always done is kind of review the book for each other and tell each other, oh my goodness, I'm reading Restart by Gordon Corman. It's the best book ever. You need to pick up this book tomorrow. Well, we can't do that when only half of us are in the classroom and the other half are at home. So what I've created through Padlet is kind of just a database of reviews. So you can see my students were reviewing the Read Aloud Restart. They all gave it a certain amount of stars. And then um, as we move through our independent reading books and our author studies, they're going in and rating their books. As you can see, my friend Hannah and Marissa just gave some ratings a couple days ago as they finished their first author study book. So it gives them a chance to chat with their friends and their friends even have an opportunity to comment, like, or you know, even respectfully disagree with their review of the books that they are reading. Um, with Padlet, we have been given a lot of opportunities to create other formats. So, you know, my students love to text. They text all the time. They use the Google Meet chat to text one another. So I've created software that allows them to communicate with each other through Padlet. Um, and with social emotional learning, we started off the school year in fifth grade, really talking about that healthy mind and that healthy body leading to a healthy life, even in the pandemic. So on the first day of school, we were able to observe some pictures and talk about what are three ways that when you're feeling rough, if you're feeling frustrated, you're feeling depressed, you're feeling upset, what are three things that you can do to help you get back on track? And some students said, talk to someone you trust, be calm, know how you feel. Some students said, um, kind of found some information. When you get stressed, adrenaline goes to your heart and makes it beat faster. Uh, try to ask a parent or a friend to calm you down. And really focusing on that you know, resilience and perseverance that is key in hybrid learning and in any kind of learning. And then finally, I just wanted to show you, especially since it is an asynchronous Wednesday, that differentiation, even for our 504 and IEP students, is key. So I was noticing right at the beginning of the school year that some of my students were struggling to find the assignments or know what work was ahead of them. And the other thing that fifth graders didn't really like doing was hitting that submit button. So I had to figure out a way to say, hey, you finished the work. Now can you submit it, please, so I can score it properly? So uh, I created a quick checklist that I taught them how to use the highlight tool to highlight as they're going throughout their day. You know, did you finish your math assignment? Yes or no? Did you submit it? Did you listen to the first chapter Wednesday? Yes or no? First chapter Wednesday is where we expose a book title by reading the first chapter and then offering it to all of our fifth graders to read from our libraries. And then you would get dismissed and you'd get to go off and either work on some fifth grade homework or enjoy your afternoon. And that's pretty much all I have to share for fifth grade. So thank you. Great, thank you so much, Brandon. That was great. So we're continuing to go younger and younger and uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Kathy. Uh, Awesome. Hi, everyone. I'm Kathy Zillahy. I'm second grade teacher at Charles Wright. Um, a lot of what Brandon said, believe it or not, overlaps with what I do. So, you know, in the interest in time and um, I'm going to not talk about clever or um, some of the other things he said, like the, I was thinking about the TC amazing resources that we have that we completely have been implementing in second grade as well. I thought what I would talk about is, well, some of, some of second grade's challenges have been that everything's brand new this year because second graders typically don't work with Chromebooks until about mid second grade year. That's when we introduce typing training and we introduce the Google suite bit by bit. But because of the nature of being hybrid, um, we started second grade with Chromebooks. So that required a lot of social emotional learning with deep breathing and a lot of talk with productive struggle. And our mantra in our classroom this year is we can do hard things. And whenever the children seem to feel overwhelmed or if 
I have a signal drop. Or if they say, Mrs. Elhi, you're frozen. We all say we can do hard things. So um, what I wanna do is something that's hard for me. I have, this is officially my very first Zoom meet ever. So I am going to attempt to share my screen, um, I think. Let's see if I can figure this out. I saw it before and now I'm not seeing it. Hold on, let me see. Oh, there we go, got it. All right, so I'm going to show you to um, basically what I do to, oh, that's really cool. Okay, got it. So I, no, um, can you see my screen? Not yet. Okay, so I'm gonna click my, oh boy. Um, I think it's my Google Chrome. Well, we'll see. Um, let's see. Oh, that's not letting me do that. Oh, you know what? I'm going to try one more time. Um, hmm. Kathy, make sure the window you want to present is um, you know present what? on your screen. Okay, so I do want to show just the window that's there. And I'm going to try one more time. And then if I can't figure this out, I'm just going to say, forget it, because I'm getting a whole bunch of options and I don't know what they mean because I've never been on this before. So Kathy, when you um, click share screen, so, the, do you see all of your windows? Yeah. Okay. So then can no. you see the one that you want to share? So I see my, but I'm getting, so Sarah, this is what I'm getting. I'm getting, um, but won't, is it going to show that? Okay. My husband just popped in because he's a Zoom expert. <laughs> but now it's asking me to show my preferences. But this is real. This is what you guys do every day when you try a new software and a new program and the students do it on their end. Oh, yeah, I think my computer's too locked down. So anyway, <laughs> sorry about that. I'm just going to talk through it. Okay. Um, all right, so I'm going to talk through what my day looks like. And so I'm with the help of some colleagues. Second grade has been a really great collaborative team. Starting last spring, we decided that we would work together to share ideas and share some resources. So every day my kids open up their Google Classroom and it's preloaded the night before and they have a message from me and then they have the link to the day's Google Slides. And so I have a Bitmoji classroom that brings us through the entire day, um, starting from the moment kids come in and they have independent work time. The children at home are expected to log on at the same time. And then at 845, sorry, I wish I could show you this, but I guess I have my computer really locked down. It won't let me share my screens. Um, I have icons, just the Google Meet icon for the parents see the schedule of the day with all of the logons. It's the exact same slide. It's the same structure every day. So they know when kids need to log on. And at open house, I said to parents, since kids cannot tell time yet in second grade um, with an analog clock, they do have experience with a digital clock. And if we could work together to understand that the time on the digital clock is the exact same as on their computer screen, they can log themselves on once they are accustomed to our daily routine. And kids have been really great. There's a Google Meet icon on each slide when kids need to join the Meet and they just click it, they're in our Meet. And I use the Chromebook to show my smart board. And Sarah, I don't know what that um, really cool camera is that I'm piloting in my room, but Sarah Harris also brought a standalone camera for when I don't need my smart board, for when I wanna teach with the easel or do a read aloud. And all of my remote learners can see me, they can see the classroom, they can see some of their other kids and the children in the classroom can see everybody else on the smart board. So it's really nice for a great classroom conversation for read aloud and it's, it's amazing. Um, so what has been successful for me is, um, the predictability of our second grade day. Primary students need the safety of a predictable day. And um, I have a block schedule that we follow. And what's really great is that 
they can see the teaching point on the slide, but then I have it linked to all of my lessons. So because of remote learning last year, we had to be really creative. And so um, I took all of my teaching lessons, all of my writer's workshop, all my reader's workshop, all my phonics lessons, and I created Google Slides presentations of all of them. And there's, because we can't give the kids their own pieces of, um, for instance, um, the phonics program, it is full of so many great hands-on resources. Well, we can't do that but we can project them onto the screen. We can scan them and put them into a Google slide presentation. And that's been really interactive. The other thing that has been the most amazing tool that I've used in my classroom has been the most low tech inexpensive tool. And that is an individual whiteboard and a dry board eraser. We are using those for everything. We are using them for phonics. We're using them for problem solving in math. The children are due, they, we do all have um, our own manipulatives. Every child has a huge Ziploc full of all the manipulatives they need. However, they are using whiteboards too to quick draw. Um, what else has been successful has been, um, what's nice is that the district has done such a great job in supporting our curriculum with technology. We know that small children need small group instruction. And what's really great is because we have the Reading A to Z suite, RAS this summer added a feature where you can create guided reading groups within RAS. So I have six different reading groups that I meet with throughout the week. And what's really cool is in RAS, they have virtual um, filing cabinets. So I've been able to go through and find books that match the needs of my learners, but they also integrate the curriculum. So right now we're studying community and, you know, between changing our schedule because we have to take mask breaks to get the children outside and out of their desks and to let them move like seven-year-olds. Um, we had to be really creative with the use of time. Well, what's really great is right now they're learning through direct lessons about community. We are reading about community in RAS Kids. We are doing guided reading groups where we're talking about different communities. And what's really nice is that um, I just have to go to the file cabinet and go to the books that I've stored and assign them to my reading groups right before we're going to do the reading lesson because they are very, very um, savvy, my seven-year-olds. And when I thought I could preload a bunch of books, they read them and what Raz does is it actually takes them out of the queue and they have to be reloaded. So that was a lot of learning for me. The other thing um, that I wanna to touch on really quickly is um, the focus on social emotional learning this year. And what's really wonderful about the structure of our day is we have a little window between lunch and special every day. And that's the time where I have used Epic and actually books of my own for read aloud. And we are, again, picking books that completely focus on concerns that second graders have, whether it's friendship, whether it's being afraid, whether it's um, trying to be brave. All of these stories allow us to have opportunities to have conversations about things that are part of our social emotional curriculum. Our social emotional curriculum, which focuses on emotions and self-regulation and problem solving can be addressed as well through the shared experience. So I think what's been a challenge has been time, time constraints and um, managing the children at home with the children who are together. I've found that to best meet the needs of all of my kids. I have my meat on for a large portion of my day. Um, I just mute it. And again, like Rochelle said, I work with the children in the classroom while keeping an eye on the children who are on the screen. And then because of the structure of all of our teachers college units, share is the major component at the end of the lesson. And so we are coming back together as a classroom community at the end of lessons. Um, to have that shared experience. And that's been wonderful. I could speak to math, but Brenda, Brandon already did it. 
And um, sorry that I could not get my screen to share from, even my husband couldn't undo it. So sorry, I hope that that helped anyhow without Kathy, the visual. <laughs> Kathy, that's great. There's no requirement to share your screen. And I think your description brought your classroom alive without it. So thank you so much. And, you know, I think you just modeled flexibility and uh, as your class mantra is, we can do it. And um, when it doesn't work, we go to something else. So I think you modeled exactly what you um, are teaching your students. So thank you for that. Yeah, and when this is the body language, I don't know, from someone who's on it all day, I just took that as a cue of keep going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was perfect. So um, we tried to be pretty informal here. So that was perfect. So thank you. So yes, we've started the journey at the high school, uh, have uh, been in the second grade. And then what does it look like in kindergarten, right? <laughs> that is the, the end of our journey today. So I'm going to turn it over to Nicole to talk about kindergarten. Hi, everyone. So I am going to try to share my screen right now. <laughs> I have not used Zoom before. So I am hoping that this will work. I, I'm thinking it will. Okay. Can you guys see my screen? Yep. I see your screen. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So um, my name is Nicole Utrusis. I am a kindergarten teacher at Emerson Williams. Um, so when thinking about, you know, I'm listening to everyone else talk about what it looks like, um, instructional practice looks like in the upper grades. Kindergarten is a whole, you know, different ball game. It's extremely different from, you know, obviously high school, but even second grade and fifth grade. So something that, um, you know, when we were thinking about how are we going to do the hybrid model with our kindergarten students when they really need hands-on activities, um, they need to be, you know, sitting with us, reading with us. So we really are using a multimodal approach. So a big part of kindergarten, as I said, is hands-on activities, but we also are incorporating the virtual activities as well um, with Seesaw and with our Google Meets. So when designing how, in how instruction looks for both in-person and students at home, we really had to think out of the box about how we can really best use our, our hands-on activities that is such a big part of kindergarten, but also um, making it so every child at home and at school can be a part of the lesson. So in the summertime, I really worked hard in thinking, you know, how can I get really like, hands-on activities for every child to have um, that they will have their own things. So we really worked hard on making math toolkits, guided reading toolkits, um, binders filled with ABC charts and sheet protectors with their name on it so they could practice writing their name. Just so many things that were individual and hands-on. Um, someone said to me a couple days ago that our kindergarten students look like college students because they have <laughs> their backpack is just filled to the brim with their own individual things and their own hands-on activities. But it's really kind of how we found uh, the best ways for them to actually use hands-on activities which is such a big and crucial part of being in kindergarten and learning, you know, how to be a student. So we worked again on these math toolkits. And so an example of how I used hands-on activities plus virtual activities as an instructional approach in my kindergarten classroom is when we've learned the numbers. So after our math lesson, which is virtual, or sometimes even during the math lesson, which is um, via Google Meet, I give my students practice um, time to practice with hands-on techniques, really, um, especially with learning numbers and with letters, they really need that time to do that. So in each child's math toolkit, they all have a 10 frame, um, counters, cubes. I have little erasers for them. I have really everything inside that math toolkit that they could use that is really hands-on. So using my doc cam, which I, we are so lucky to have a doc cam in our classroom because I am constantly showing and modeling um, things for the children under it, but I show them how to model, um, you know, how do I, how do you make the number six? That's what we're learning about this week. How do you make the number six on a 10 frame? So I will show it to them with um, cubes or counters and then they'll try it. And then at the same time, the students at home are doing the same thing. Um, and then after that, I have them start to experiment. I, you know, at using math talk questions. If I took away one, can you count how many you have left? Those types of questions are having them think, you know, higher level thinking questions, but it also really is engaging them as well um, through hands-on activities while the students at home are, are also following along with us. 
And we also love, we call them snake letters or snake numbers where they use Play-Doh. Um, I was, you know, worried in the beginning of the year. I'm like, how am I going to get hands-on activities for these kids so they can practice really using the, um, like learning the numbers and the letters. So thinking outside the box, they can always use Play-Doh. Play-Doh, they'll have their own Play-Doh tub that they can use. So today they, or not today, but yesterday they worked on making the number six with their Play-Doh. Um, so really making sure that we are doing a mix of virtual and hands-on activities is so important. And um, always after we do an activity, so after either it's phonics or math or reader's workshop or writer's workshop, I have a seesaw activity that goes along with it. It's a follow-up activity. And this is just a way for them to show me what they've learned. And again, there this is also a mix of hands-on and virtual. For reading, they send me a video like this. Um, yesterday, I had, you know, um, 21 kids sending me their videos of them reading a book and acting like the character. So there are definitely ways that we can also incorporate these, um, you know, the normal kindergarten things, but also just putting um, the, a virtual spin on it so that, you know, the kids at home can show me what they've learned as well. And I find this instructional me method to be really engaging for both the students that are in person and at home because it, it really is the basic of what basis of what kindergarten is. So that's the hands-on, the interactive, and also what we're using now, which is the virtual, to really teach the learning objectives and to keep students always engaged. Um, and something that we also do that I, I really find helpful for the students that are either fully remote or um, students that you know, the, the different cohorts is for the remote, remote learners, we have um, a pickup day where they can come to the office or the um, a secretary will actually sometimes hand them the activities outside of the office window so they don't have to come in the building. Um, but we always have a, a Friday pickup day where our remote learners can get some more hands-on activities. So whether that's they're getting paper books from the classroom that I make or I give them or um, more writing paper or a craft that we're going to do really just making sure that we're keeping them the remote learners you know doing what this the same things that we're doing but giving them also an experience to have hands-on learning as well um and when thinking about designing my instruction to engage all of the learners like i said a multimodal multi multimodal approach is really the way to go because um, it really helps students to stay engaged and interactive, interacted in the store, um, in the lessons. And especially in kindergarten, we want to make sure that we are engaging the students and keeping them, you know, focused because this is very hard for these little guys. It's very different when you look at kindergarten, you know, even a year ago to how it is now. Um, they're not on the rug. They're not at a desk with their friends. They are sitting at a desk and um, it, it's, it's very different. They, they need to be moving and they need to be interact, you know, engaged in what they're doing because it's just so different. Um, and I will say I was so worried this summer thinking about how are my kindergartners going to make friends? How are they going to, you know, have that kindergarten experience that I know students really need? I have been so pleasantly surprised to see how these children really have adapted to situations. Um, you know, being at a desk can sometimes be a struggle, but they're still able to talk with friends and play at recess together. And it still feels like a classroom community, even when, you know, even with my remote learners and my students that are in person. Um, but like I said, we really wanna make sure that we are really engaging students. And um, I know I've talked to you guys before, I think it was last year about the phonics program that we have, um, the Teachers College phonics program, but um, a big, big part of the phonics program is this stuffed elephant Mabel, which um, it, it seems silly, but this year I am leaning on Mabel more than I ever did the past couple of years because she really, really, and I say she, it's a stuffed animal, but she really keeps the students engaged and interacted in the lesson. Um, you know, she's a really big part of the phonics curriculum. Um, for example, Mabel likes to leave notes for the kids. Um, in the beginning of the year when we were learning about keeping our mask on. 
I had a mask on Mabel and, you know, we would talk about keeping the mask over your nose and your mouth. So they really love this stuffed animal. And it, I really try to incorporate it, it into almost every lesson that we do just because it really helps the students that are at home and the students that are in school feel connected to the classroom. And they really love it. They think that Mabel is whispering in my ear about, you know, a lesson that we're about to do or that she's really leaving them notes. So it really does keep them interacted and engaged in, in what we're doing. So something that we do to really engage both in-person and remote learners is through the use of Seesaw. This is our learning platform platform. Um, the upper grades are using Google Classroom, but we're using Seesaw. And um, I'm really finding Seesaw to be very kid friendly. And um, it took a lot, a lot, a lot of modeling in the beginning of the year about how do you use Seesaw? How are you going to take a video or a picture on Seesaw? But they've really gotten the hang of it. And again, um, like I said, we're really mixing in that um, hands-on approach with the virtual approach. So for example, this activity was, um, I had given each of them a name, um, their name, kind of like that, where there was the directions about how to form the letters in their name. And they saw a picture of how Mabel spells her name. And then they had to try it too. And they, um, and they took a picture of it. So again, that's the mix of the virtual and the hands-on activities. Um, but like I said, keep keeping up with how to really engage both of my in-person and remote learners is really important and it does really help to create a positive learning environment um, right now we are finishing up well tomorrow we're finishing up with our parent teacher conferences um, and i really got to talk to parents of remote learners because i haven't actually I've seen them and I work with them, but it's so different. So um, I got to talk to them about, you know, how are they liking being at home learning? Um, are they engaged with the lessons? And I have heard so many positive things about, um, you know, what we're doing and how we engage the remote learners while we're um, also engaging the in-person learners. I actually had a parent today tell me that I was a magician because he does not understand how I handle my kindergartners that are in my room and also engage the students that are home and keep on top of technology and my lesson that's going on. So sometimes I do feel like a magician, but it's just nice to see that, that the students that are at home are actually engaged and really do enjoy coming on to the Google Meets and doing the Seesaw activities um, and really just being a part of our classroom community. Um, and then for social emotional learning, this has really been such a huge part of our year this year, especially because a lot of, um, well, uh, almost all of them that were in preschool last year, they missed out on so many months of preschool and preschool is really crucial for young children. So it was really important for us to, you know, have social emotional learning be a really important part of our classroom. So whether it's reading storybooks or we have a lot of talks about social emotional learning and you know, right now they don't really even know what a feeling is. So we're talking about what, you know, different types of feelings and what you can do when you feel that way. So we're really making it a huge part of our, um, our classroom community. Um, but, you know, to, to conclude, I would say, you know, um, it really is, it's not easy at, at all. It's, it's probably, I mean, I've left school in tears sometimes. I mean, it's just, it's, it's very, it's a very challenging year, but you know what I will say that from talking with parents today, it is, ha, has been so incredibly rewarding to, I, I feel like I really know these learners that are with us this year. Um, I mean, obviously I've known my learners from past years too, but with such a small group right now, I know um, who might be, who needs help with this during writing time or who might need help with, um, with even knowing some of these letter sounds when they're reading. So I feel like I really know these, these learners and even the remote learners too. Um, I would say remote Wednesdays have been so helpful. So thank you guys for also keeping up with that once we do go um, back because we're back with the full um, everyone comes back because that has really been so crucial to get to know my remote learners that I really, you know, I see them during the Google meets and I, but I, I don't know them as well as I need to, because I want to know, you know, and work with them and what they're struggling with. So that has really been very helpful, but I will definitely say this year has obviously had its challenges, but I have learned so much about as myself as a teacher, I've learned so much from these children. And I've also learned, as I said before, how resilient children are. And it has truly been, I, I think about it now and it like brings tears to my eyes that I was so worried over the summer about 
how will they do with a mask on? How will they be where they can't be right next to a friend? They have been just amazing. And it really just is inspiring to see that they um, are just so resilient and happy to really, really, really happy to be in school. And I am too now. So it's been great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicole. Um, uh, I also want to echo uh, Mark and put a shout out in the chat, chat box for Sarah Harris um, and the entire tech team for their support. Um, as you imagine, many of the questions are tech related and sharing resources. Um, so I want to do a shout out to Sarah and the tech team. Um, and also, you know, thank all of our teaching staff for their collaboration. In the spirit of collaboration, we are all in this together and learning together, as you saw modeled today. Um, and so that collaboration helping to each other and our peers is so critical. So there's a lot of themes I could talk about. So incredibly proud uh, of the work that's happening in classrooms each and every day. But I want to open it up to any questions from the board members. Yeah, I just want to, am I on? Yeah. I you just are. wanted to make a comment. Um, as I'm listening to everybody today, I'm in awe, absolute awe of where we've come in such a short period of time. Um, about five years ago, I had a conversation with Keith Raffanello and Sarah Harris is now our Keith Raffanello. And Keith said, oh no, we can't go into the 21st century that fast. We just mm -hmm. can't. You know, we gotta give the teachers time. Well, we got slingshotted into the 21st century with this pandemic. And I have to give you all the kudos in the world for having just picked up, done the job, and our students never seem to have lost a beat. They're working, they're learning. Um, you people might be leave, leaving in tears. I don't see how you're not every day um, because this is a constant learning. Um, but I must say this is, Incredible. In education, this is an incredible feat you have done. Congratulations. Jim. Uh, something to say. Uh, my, my daughter at SDMS, she's uh, completely remote for the time being. Um, I'm, I'm just amazed that uh, I had no idea all this was, was going on. So it's pretty impressive. And, and you know, I'm not thankful that there's a, a pandemic, but I'm hoping that that some of these things can be carried over even when when folks go back into the classroom uh, full time. So thank thanks so much uh, to all of you for your hard work and efforts. And very cute, Kelly. <laughs> Yeah, I have a quick, just a quick question. Um, again, thank you for the presentation. They're very thorough. And uh, obviously I know everyone on the board that's here tonight and others who are not uh, are very appreciative of all the efforts you're doing. Uh, I, I guess I just had a one question and you may have brought it up when I was having a problem with my microphone. So, um, and this may be more from the administrative side than the school side. So how are we, uh, with the parents as a general rule that uh, obviously this is as much a, uh, a challenge for parents obviously at home and how much resources are you using or how much more do you need to deal with parents uh, at this time either counseling them answering questions they have about follow-up working together that kind of thing I mean I assume there's no hard and fast one-size-fits-all approach but how are you, um, what are you hearing from parents in terms of their either frustrations or their excitement uh, with this new learning model, this new hybrid model? Yeah, Brandon? Oh, Brandon. <laughs> Apologize for my dog barking, I'll turn that off. Uh, that's a great question, Chris. And I definitely think that parents have really rallied around the idea that we are a collective team, that, you know, learning has always been a partnership of the teacher, the family, and the community as a whole. And I think that partnership has been put into full spotlight now. So when it comes to technology issues, Sarah Harris's team has been great about having an email uh, option where families can email them and reach out to coordinate if there's hardware problems or tech issues. Um, I know from the fifth grade standpoint, we're lucky to have both the G suite of software, so Gmail and Google Hangouts and Google Meet, 
as well as we have um, Go Guardian chats, which allow for live in in real time typing back and forth, almost like an AOL instant messenger. So that way parents, if their kids are having a trouble with the computer or even if the student is having a trouble, they can self advocate and ask for that assistance. And we can see the problems that they're having on the screen in real time. I think that really has helped to mitigate some of the technology issues, at least from the fifth grade standpoint. So do we have the, do we have the resources to do that with a lot of our formatting, our, our software to, to communicate with the parents, whether it's in real time there or as a follow-up after a, a, a class is over, maybe a parent says, oh, my kid just came to me about something and I'm trying to follow up. I'm assuming we're doing all these things. I just want the public to know that we are, obviously, and that you know they should. any parent should obviously feel that they can, and I know they do feel they can reach out. And I, but I want to know from your perspective, do you have everything you need to kind of carry that out in terms of a technology background or a resource background? Yeah, so um, Chris, we have a, a tech support hotline for families who prefer a phone, um, and we also have a tech support email address. Um, and our families have been great about using those. Um, we have a number of different IT specialists um, who monitor those, as well as our one of our computer lab assistants from the high school who has been uh, really instrumental in working with families. Um, we'll do Google Meets with families. We walk them through the process of whatever it is they're trying to do um, and setting up, if, if necessary, setting up opportunities for them to come into the school and exchange equipment if, if that's um, the best option for the students. So our families have really utilized uh, both the, the voicemail option and the email option. Um, we also offered in uh, August, as well as early September, um, a variety of different opportunities for families to come and learn about some of our instructional technology tools. So Google Classroom and Seesaw and PowerSchool and a couple other options, um, all in virtual formats. Uh, and we had more than 250 uh, responses uh, to those those live workshops, which was great. So we had a whole variety of families across, really across all, all seven of our schools. Um, and families continue to, to use those because we recorded them so we can see that families are continuing to go back and watch those tutorials. Um, so we're offering both those live options as well as those, those recorded options. Um, and I, I think that families feel comfortable reaching out if they have questions. Thank you, sir. And thank you, Sally, for answering that. I, I assume that was going on. I just sometimes it's good to hear that so the public does know that we are in, engaged on that and constantly trying to work through all these uh, historic issues and I could compliment you on that and I think it's great I just I just wanted to yeah. make sure we for the record we had that in the record thank you Chris yeah that's a great question thank you can I just say something quick um sorry that Jane bombed your presentation she was getting real cranky with her dad um thank you so much for your presentations uh, I enjoyed all of them they're super informative they get me really excited um I have two kids at Hanmer and I've said a thousand times that I am in complete awe of what these teach, what their teachers are doing every day to keep them motivated and engaged. And it's just been unbelievable to watch. And I just thought it was super interesting to see how kind of STMS is working and all the way up to the high school. It's making me really excited for all the cool things that, um, my kids get to do. Who knew there was a film class at the high school? That's awesome. I wish that was there when I was there. Um, so I, uh, the only question I really have that we're, we're moving into kind of a return back to full time and graded and we're kind of getting that. Um, do you guys have any reservations? Do you have any big concerns as we're moving into that a full time schedule rather than the hybrid? So I'll start and then if somebody wants to jump in, I, mean, I think there's a lot of questions. Um, when we started distance learning, there was a million questions, right? Somebody said when we, the summer coming back to a hybrid model, there was a million questions. Um, I would say that everybody on here has a million questions about how does that impact the instructional model? How am I gonna make it work, right? Um, and so those are the conversations that are occurring right now. 
Um, we look at health guidance, we look at our district priorities, and then we look to our teachers as experts in the classroom and what's working. Um, I think there's a, a strategy I'm seeing um, more and more, and that's talking about the past, the present, and the future. And what we're finding is it, it's different, but it's like the past. And so you found teachers, or you heard teachers today talk about what they had done, and, and similarly, what they're doing, but it looks a little bit different. And so I think that um, I, I'm hearing and seeing a lot more themes around it is different, it's implemented different, it's planning different, but yet there's a lot of elements of what we used to do pre-pandemic that are so true today. Um, how we engage students, the importance of building relationships, um, supporting their social emotional development, developing their skills. We're doing it more through a screen and we're using a lot more technology. The way we set up processes and procedures um, and give students feedback, those are all elements of really good instruction um, that are still occurring, but they look differently. And so I think that we're definitely seeing a theme of kind of the past, the present, and the future maybe isn't as scary as we thought, but it is different. And um, I think the hard part is nobody has all those answers right now, right? Like we we're, we have a lot of questions and we're exploring a lot of things and talking a lot of things. Um, but I will tell you that the first day of uh, having students in the classroom this year was probably the most memorable day of my entire career. When I walked into a kindergarten classroom and the kindergarten teacher looked at me and said, they're all on the screen and it's working, right? That was probably like the best day of my entire career of a kindergarten teacher saying it's working. And that was day one. Um, you know, so there was so much hope and potential um, will be a day I never forget. So I'll um, open it up to teachers if you, you know, have other things you want to add on, but I think there's, you know, definitely more questions. And I think that's the hard part about everything right now is just like we settle into routine, then it changes and we have to figure it out and nobody knows all the answers. So Kelly, um, I am one of the kindergarten teachers at Emerson Williams. So for kindergarten, we're starting back with everyone coming back um, in less than two weeks. So this has been, um, obviously, a lot of teachers are thinking about it, but it's very much coming becoming a reality in less than two weeks with our kindergartners. Um, so although I am extremely happy because I know that these kids really need to be in school for, you know, longer than those two days. They thrive off of routine. Um, I am, I'm definitely worried. Um, obviously, like Sally said, there's a lot of questions, but I'm definitely worried about um, not only, you know, obviously social distancing and everything like the, the safety me measures of it, but also um, just still keeping up with the Google Meets that we're doing with our remote learners. Um, right now, I only have three remote learners and um, I'll have 18 children back in my classroom. And um, I think, think that obviously this is very hard being a hybrid teacher and, you know, working with my students that are at school and at home. Um, but I really think that it's going to be very, very difficult to, you know, manage my 18 children and also be engaging my three remote children. So um, that's kind of, you know, as a kindergarten teacher and since we're, you know, we're starting back in less than two weeks, those are really my thoughts right now. Thank you. To echo Nicole as a fifth grade teacher at Hanmer and Kelly, you're probably very aware of this being a Hanmer family, uh, that we are blessed with a lot of space at Hanmer Elementary School, but I know that some other elementary schools in our district don't have as much space for that social distancing requirement. So I guess my reservation is, and it's a question, as Sally said, more questions than answers, is by loosen it, losing part of that social distancing mitigation strategy, how does that impact the spread? And with the way the data has been going state and national wise, is this a dance that we're gonna take one step in and then have to take two steps back? Uh, sorry, I had other kids screaming in the background. Um, Thank you so much again for everything. I think um, you guys are truly magicians. I've, I'm so in awe of how hard you guys, how hard your lives must be. I know a number of teachers in the district and I listen to them and they are so proud of their students, but they're so stressed at the same time. So I hope you all are taking care of yourself and you're trying to find time to relax and unplug when you can, because I'm sure you need that too. Thank you, Kelly. Any other questions? No. 
Does that conclude our evening? I think that does. I just want to again thank everybody for coming. I would agree and echo the word awe. That is also the word that I wrote down. I think that's the theme today. Um, so thank you all. I know you're incredibly busy and you took um, a couple hours of your schedule to spend time with us tonight. So we greatly appreciate that. And um, I think at 834, we can call the meeting to end, Chris. We shall call to end. Thanks again, everyone. Have a safe uh, thank evening you, and a safe thank tomorrow. You. Thank you for thank all you your work. Good night. Thank you all. Good night.